Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the um, obscure Splunk uh, Follow the Money, Follow the Data webinar series hosted by Herman Singh. My name is Paul Raynaud. I'm the Regional Sales Director for Splunk in South Africa. Um, so I'm just going to introduce everybody, our panelists here. We're um, very honored to have some outstanding luminaries on the panel other than our host, Herman Singh. We've got Herman Young, who's the CISO of Investec. Thanks very much for Herman for taking part. Jason O'Reilly, who is with Advance. We've seen him on the TV lately commenting around some of the num uh, number of the cyber attacks we've seen. And then Demetrius Vergos, who is the SE leader for Splunk out of um, the emerging markets. So just by way of introduction, this is the second in the series. There will be others. Uh, this will be focused around um, security and I'll leave it to Herman. And just before we go, um, just a reminder, anybody who is interested in this .conf, which is the Splunk signature event. Uh, the virtual event is free. It's happening on the 19th, 20th of October. So feel free to sign up for that. Um, without further ado then, let me turn it over to the clever people. Thanks very much, Herman. Off you go. Thanks, Paul, and welcome to the panelists and welcome to our attendees. Real pleasure to be with you again uh, for, for this, the second in our thought leadership series on follow the money, follow the data. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, the data-driven enterprise and how we architect organizations to be compliant by design and resilient by nature. Uh, what we want to talk about is, is I think, going to be quite exciting, and I'm going to run through three case studies, but please, I really wanted to encourage all the attendees to uh, please load your, your questions into the chat box. We'd love to get uh, in interaction with the audience and load your questions anytime as we go through this, this uh, presentation. What we're going to talk about uh, in, in our narrative today is, is actually three case studies. The first one is, what are the risks around distributed operations because of um, of of COVID and the work from home situation. What are, the, are some of the trends that we're seeing in, in cyber crime and ransomware? And finally, um, what, what are we learning about single points of failure that have come to the fore and what implications come out of this and how should we be thinking about it? And then I'll throw it open to this very esteemed panel to give us their thoughts about how this stuff's working in the real world. So let's dive into the first case study, work from home. Work from home hit us last year. You know, it's hard to believe 575 days of work from home. And that's what happened to Zoom, Zoom share price. And that's what happened to the share price of airlines. On the right hand side is what happened to the number of people moving through American airports. You can see this collapse, 95% collapse in the number of people flying. And so we, we adopted this concept of, well, don't move people to the work, move people, move the work to the people. And that's no, no, no different to what Uber did, right? Uber switched from a company that moved people to food to a company that moved food to people. And actually, that's the amazing thing about, about COVID is flipped the whole world completely over. Now, one of the challenges, of course, is that we didn't just use Zoom. We were using Zoom. We were using SharePoint, the internet, you know, uh, WhatsApp, Trello, Slack digital signatures, massive adoption of, of, uh, of apps and, and new services. And I guess there, there's some risks in doing what we did. And in a sense, we've been able to work from home for 20 years. We just didn't do it. But we didn't expect to switch on work from home for 90% of the workforce in a month, which is what happened. And obviously, that introduced a number of, 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 of things that happened. The first thing that happened is, well, the, the ISPs couldn't handle this, right? We, you, you look at the increase in the number of ISP outages, we took a lot of hits, right? And we had, in, in fact, we had, if you look at this globally, the number of, of outages last year in April uh, hit 250 in one week. Uh, from and 124 of them were just in the United States. So there's dramatic increase, in particular in, in tier two, tier three networks. Uh, and of course, we, we had the century link outage in the United States. Um, the next big challenge, of course, is, you know, we, we, we threw all this tech at data security, but we didn't solve for Dave. Nobody solved for Dave. Right. And so the problem that you've got is actually it's a social problem. Right. If you look at what's happening, uh, the, the World Health Organization's uh, chief security officer said purely because of COVID, the number of hacking at, uh, attempts at the agency soared 300 percent. The amount of monetary damage being caused by this is, is escalating exponentially. And you can see two years ago what some of the, the costs are looking like. The estimate is this year we could be seeing numbers as high as six trillion dollars now. The world economy is a $70 trillion economy. 
So we're talking about some immense numbers here and some immense increases. Why is this getting worse and, and the COVID and, and work from home? Well, two big things. And the first issue is if you look at devices, one in four devices now have critical security apps that are out of compliance. If you look at client management, encryption, even the VPN, where we should be in terms of best in class and where the average is, you can see that the security control health on average is a challenge globally. In addition to that, what, what a lot of us have been doing, and I'm guilty of this as well, is we downloading data off the corporate system and we're storing it on our devices lo locally. And if you look at the percentage increase in sensitive data found on devices uh, pre-COVID versus post-COVID, you can see this immense accumulation of sensitive data that's piling up at the endpoints, which needs to be protected. The challenge you've got is if you go out now and you ask employees, so what do you want to do now? Well, 73% of us want to carry on with flexible work and, and, and hybrid work. So it's very clear that this situation that we've created is going to perpetuate into the future. We need to think about how to solve this. So that's the first case study I wanted to just leave you to think about is we've created a problem and in a sense a monster which we still are dealing with. The second challenge you've got, which is now making the situation worse, is this immense increase in ransomware attacks. Now, if you think about ransomware, well, ransomware has been around for a long time, right? The AIDS Trojan was spread by 20K floppy disks sent in the post. And that started in 1989. 2005, we saw GP code, then Revton, which was a screen, the first screen locker ransomware, also known as police ransomware. 2013, we had crypto locker. And people played around with this. Ransomware was a hobby. It was, a, I mean, it, it was mis, mischievous. It was a nuisance until Bitcoin became available. And when Bitcoin became available, you basically had a non-fungible, anonymized method of paying that was easily transferable via email. And we then saw that hacks have been weaponized. And because of that, you can see between 2015, <clears throat> as, as, as Bitcoin became more popular, this immense increase in the, in the level of, of ransomware attacks. And, and all ransomware attacks pretty much around the world are resolved and paid for using Bitcoin. In a recent survey, half of all companies said they're willing to pay the ransom in Bitcoin if they have to. And it's, although services industries are being hit a lot, all industries are vulnerable. I mean, we, we've seen in South Africa the, the, the impact on the transportation in industry. And the lead cause is actually phishing and spam. So the, the key, the keys to the kingdom are actually coming in through social engineering as they always have. Here's a, a, an example of what happened to Colonial Pipeline. As a result of Colonial Pipeline being hit, um, they actually lost the entire pipeline on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Price of petrol went up, queuing went up, rationing was introduced. Yeah, rationing, not, not, not England. This is the, the eastern seaboard of the United States. And in fact, they paid the ransom. And the amazing thing about that particular event was somehow, and it's not totally clear how this was done. The FBI was able to recover 80% of that, of that Bitcoin. It's got something to do with the way it was stored and the, and it, the way that, the, in, in a sense, the criminal syndicate didn't protect the, the, the money. So the criminal syndicate actually got robbed. So the, the big challenge that's coming out of this and becoming apparent um, is, especially as IoT rolls out and we start gathering more and more data, is that our ability to collect data has overwhelmed our ability to secure it. And this is now becoming a real challenge globally where you've got mountains of data and you've got to ask the question, do we want this much data because it exposes us to so much risk, especially in a world that's where the attacks are becoming more and more insidious from malware and Trojans, which we've always seen. We've got the criminal insiders. You know, I mean, if you could go and look at the number of laptops that get stolen in companies, it is absolutely horrific how much of, of data is on devices that are stolen. And, and, you know, and we've got the old faithfuls, malware, phishing, man in the middle, denial of service attacks, uh, cross-site scripting, and of course the, the SQL um, injection attacks. So, so that's the second point, is this vulnerability caused by Bitcoin ransomware and the combination of the accumulation of, of data. The third problem, of course, is the fact that we're now starting to see, and it's always been there, but we suddenly become acutely aware of the single points of failure that are embedded in our lives. Of course, I, I, I couldn't possibly do a presentation like this without talking about yesterday. Okay, the outage outrage has really freaked all of us out because I guess, especially WhatsApp, uh, that, that, I mean, I had to actually switch to uh, Apple messaging for some of my, my clients and I had to, and I, and I was amazed by the number of people that suddenly joined Telegram yesterday, purely because WhatsApp went, went down. 
So clearly single points of failure are embedded in our lives, but I don't think we realize how bad it is until March, April last year, when in fact, Facebook took a hit and Facebook who were able to handle New Year's Eve and the Olympics now said because of record use, they had to reduce bit rates on Facebook and Instagram videos and the added capacity. Google warned that G Suite may be affected if the data centers were affected. And even Microsoft Azure said that they were taking strain, they were deprioritizing gaming, they were remo removing certain functionality uh, from some of the, 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 um, the, the cloud services that, that Microsoft supplied. And all of this stuff, by the way, is straight off the web, it's, a, it's clearly available. So that's the first point where you've got the, the hyperscale is taking a, a hit. The, the, the next problem that you had is companies we'd never heard of were suddenly compromised, right? Cloudflare, Mo most of us had never heard of Cloudflare. And so it turns out that Cloudflare actually powers 12% of all websites in the world. They were compromised in one hack. Now we're not sure whether it was actually exploited, but there clearly was a vulnerability. And the problem you've got is, is that was 240 million websites that were suddenly exposed due to a, a JavaScript uh, issue. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't exploited, but the vulnerability was suddenly exposed. The one that, that did affect us was when, when a CDN crashed and most of us had never heard of Fastly. And suddenly a huge chunk of the internet went down, especially on the content distribution side, because a CDN uh, firm went down and brought down a huge chunk of the internet with it. Uh, so, so clearly single points of failure are becoming key. Uh, so what are the imperatives? And some of the things that we need to be thinking about are, well, we initially adopted DevOps as a way of, of simplifying the way that we develop software to make it more agile and more robust simultaneously. So the ability to kind of manage, manage the architecture and the development practices, the way that we did quality assurance and the way that we did technology operations, in theory was meant to solve the silo situs that we had in big companies. But it turned out that this wasn't enough. And although many companies have started the journey and you look 25% have undertaken the DevOps journey, they say the few teams in my company are fully immersed in DevOps. And some of them have said they fully embrace DevOps. Clearly DevOps is a key part of the, of the recipe going forward. What's key is the rate of change outside the organization is still faster than the rate of change inside the organization. And when that is true, that is a very dangerous situation. If people outside the organization are adapting and changing faster than people inside the organization, especially on the security front. So what's the missing link on DevOps has always been security. That's really the piece that's been left out. And we, it's starting to become, uh, I guess, an, um, an omission that's creating vulnerability. So going forward, what we're starting to see more and more is the adoption of DevSecOps, where Dev focuses on software releases and updates, um, ops is focusing on reliability, performance, and scaling, and obviously doesn't want changes to happen once we've moved into the runtime environment. And SEC is focusing on confidentiality, availability, and integrity. So in the perfect world, we are actually designing things to be resilient by design. And so the, this, this conversion that we're seeing is really this, this overlapping area where development, IT, ops, security, and application delivery live at the center. The question is, what does this mean in practice and how does this work in practice? Well, if you think about DevOps, DevOps tends to focus on, you know, how do we develop our API services? How do we change the world to be more services orientated? How do we automate everything? And of course, you know, we're very agile, let's fail fast, let's fail often, and you manage your workflow using Kanban tickets. DevSecOps, on the other hand, is really about secure development. It's about secure configuration and secure uh, deployment and it tends to focus on architecture because often th that's where the vulnerability is it's on the architecture side and very much focused on the use of, of scrum teams in an iterative world and what do I mean by iterative what I mean is that that you, you live in a world where you've got dev you've got ops but it's wrapped in the security component that you start planning your your, your code you create it you verify it it goes into pre-prod you release it it gets configured you detect issues you respond you predict you adapt and you go back into plan. So you've got this iterative monitoring and analytics and you can start to see the role that observability has because observability allows you to keep this iterative process moving. A very, very, very powerful piece. So my final slide, just in, in wrapping up, what does all of this mean and how do we know we, we are getting to the, to the end game? Well, 
if you get DevSecOps working properly, what's, what's clear is you, you're going to have very clear open collaboration Operation around shared, shared objectives between the, the run team, the development team, and the security team. You, you're going to start to embed security at source. Um, you'll reinforce and elevate uh, a lot of the security components through automation of the systems. You'll have more of a risk oriented operations uh, focus, and you'll have more actionable insights. You'll have the security team giving you actionable insights that you can actually work on to use to improve your operations. Which, give, which will eventually give you a more holistic approach to security objectives and much better proactive monitoring and, and iterative feedback. Now, this is the theory. And what I wanted to do was to stop there and revert to our esteemed panel of experts between uh, Jason, Herman, and Dimitris and, and get their sense of this journey and where we, we are, are going. So to the panelists, welcome, gentlemen. Really great to have you on. You've heard my spiel, and, and, and you know, I've, I've reached out into the world and pulled out pieces of data. Are they, are they random pieces of data, or are we connecting them in the right way? Let's, let, let's discuss this with the panel. Jason, if I can start with, with you. I mean, I think the security community has spent a lot of time evangelizing the need for an alternative response to, to threats. Why do you think this is not having the desired responses in, in businesses? Well, I think, and, and, and good morning, uh, Herman and, and team. I think for, for me, and, and again, I, I learned so much from my customers and, and have done for the past 21 years is, you know, one of the things that we've seen, you know, is cybersecurity and information security have sat in the corner for many, many years and there's been silos, right? Um, and, and now the silos have really come very, very close to the board table. In fact, uh, uh, most of the CISOs like Herman and Co are now very much of an integral part of the board table. However, those silos haven't disappeared. So one of the things that we see quite a bit in, especially larger organizations where, you know, there's an expectation of agility and transformation, um, the cultural aspects of what that actually looks like. So that lovely infinity figure of eight that you shows that it all just happens, right? Um, is not something that happens in real life. Um, and also we find um, the people that are acquiring uh, solutions and technologies and, and really pushing the change. Um, like you've just said, the organization isn't ready. Uh, the processes aren't ready. Uh, you know, we're outsourcing to India and Pakistan and whoever else that there is that we're outsourcing to. So trying to embed this DevSec conversation um, really starts to take a cultural challenge. Um, so, you know, again, we, we see that being a significant, um, a significant stumbling block for organizations that are trying to embrace this agility, but having to get through corporate politics, whose budget does it come out of? And, and most importantly, you know, how do you how do you try and pull this all together and who's accountable? Because you know, that's where we're going with uh, with the modern day CISO today, right? Accountability. You're spending all my money, uh, but I want to see where it's going, right? <laughs> Let's ask the CISO. Let's ask the CISO. That's a, such a great question, by the way. Who's accountable? Herman, can we bring you in? I, I mean, who is accountable in this world? And why is, is culture such a big, I guess, obstacle to this process, which it feels like it should be obvious, and it, yet it isn't? Hi, oh, and morning. Thanks, Herman. It's uh, Jason. That's a, that's a great question. And it's such a whew, culture. Um, like, what is culture? Like, there's people that will wax lyrical for hours on what culture actually means. What we mean with culture is that it is a set of beliefs, it's a set of actions, it's the intangible, it's the it's the, the, the stuff in the aircon, it's how people behave, right? So so that's that's first of all why it's hard. But to get back to the actual question, um, I I truly believe, and then Jason touched on it like very well, to say that the, the culture of the organization allows you to succeed or not. I mean, absolutely, especially in security and in other areas, right? So so why do I say that? First of all, your culture typically allows you to attract and retain talent, right? That's a key aspect. But also, does the organization allow you to succeed? Can you move fast? Can you keep pace with stuff? And there, you're talking about silos, you're talking about different priorities, you're talking about, you know, I'm only worried about my P&L, um, I don't care about the rest. So, I mean, who's accountable, who's responsible? the board is ultimately accountable right we all know this that's 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 what the theory says and that's what should happen in practice the board's accountable they delegated responsibility to management you know management then um as to implement um you know the the solution so 
quite honestly, and it sounds a bit, um, you know, um, it, it's not news to anybody. It, uh, it it starts at the top, right? So the, that, that, that culture permeates through the whole organization. So um, how do we address that? I guess it, I mean, it's a risk discussion at the end of the day, right? The, first of all, the organization has to know we are in the risk mitigation business at the end of the day. The, the board, the execs must know that these risks exist. You must, uh, the, you know, obviously the role of a CISO and, and, and a CIO and the CTO is to say, here are the risks. How can we make it practical? practical? How can we address it? How can we remediate it? Not avoid it. I mean, there's often this, um, on the one hand, people sort of ignore the risks or they try and actually avoid it completely, which is never possible. So, yeah, there's so many things to talk about. I don't want to steal all the time. But um, mm -hmm. I think culture for us, lastly, is I think it's actually as an organization is one of our biggest differentiators. And it's one of the things that allows us to succeed in security and in other areas. Thank you, Herman. That's a super, super answer. In fact, if, I'm, I'm going to leave you with a thought, which I want to come back to. But I want to pose, I want to plant it with you now. Is it as much culture? as much as it is structure. So maybe I'll, I'm going to come back to you with that thought, because in a way, the way we structure into silos with different measures, in fact, may, maybe part of the problem lies in the structure space. I want to come back to that. I just want to get Dimitris's view on this culture topic while we're on culture. What's your sense here? What insights can you bring to bear on, on this from, from your perspective working out of Dubai, you working in a different region? What are you seeing there? Sure. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. So I've been working in what we call emerging markets. So it spans from Dubai to South Africa. I work with people in the Balkans, in Israel, Turkey, Poland. So culture plays a big role in understanding how every person thinks, what they want, what they want to achieve is extremely important to get things done. And I think we touched upon three topics, right? We touched upon culture, we touched upon risk, we touched upon change. And everything is interconnected because one helps the other. So depending on the culture that you're dealing with, the people that you're dealing with, there is a specific appetite for change. And every time something needs to change, progress, evolve, there's always fear. Everyone is scared. I'm scared of changing a gym that I may go in the evening, right? I'm, I'm, I'm scared of even changing sometimes a subscription model I may have for specific software, right? Something simple to something big, it always scares us. So depending on how internally the culture is built how people believe that a change will help them and how much the business supports all of this will be able to help change bring the team along because if there's no fear right if they know the culture is is, is good there's there's the ability to make mistakes as we evolve and change things from a business perspective from a security perspective everything helps and flows in an easier manner they're always the people that they will be the early adopters those people who will you know, go along and help and push, they're always the people who are skeptical and they'll always be behind. But as you start evolving and changes start happening in, in small you know, spaces and small places and you see the progress, everyone will come along and assist in this change, right? And I see this across the globe. It doesn't matter what organization you're working for, right? What firm, what vertical you're in as well. Culture is the most important thing. And of course, when it comes down to risk, it depends on every single organization, right? You have the more traditional organizations who are more risk averse. You have the more digital natives, for example, the startups who are more risk prone because they, they see that you know, they need to evolve over time. But if you look at it from a macro perspective, everyone is seeing in the world that we live today, you need to evolve or you're going to stay back and die. So risk is becoming more in the board's level blood. It's being pushed downward as well and being promoted. And this kind of, you know, trickles down to culture and afterwards to change as well over time. So that's, that's my thoughts around culture and change and risk as well. Lovely, Dimitris. You know, you, I, I love your comments about risk uh, because in, in, in a world where we, we're having to move so fast, that's so competitive, uh, risk is the reward for profit actually so, so in other words i mean profit is a reward for taking risk i, I beg your pardon I, I read this beautiful quote that said 
to make profit without risk is like living without being born. <laughs> and, and in fact, we, I, I love Herman's comment that we're in the risk mitigation business, actually. So I want to go back to, to Herman on, on that. Dimitri give us a, a really interesting perspective that, you know, organizations are pro-risk, risk averse. You said we're in the risk mitigation business. So risk keeps coming up. It's an inherent part of what we're doing. I mean, do you think we are structured? I want to come back to that point because are we structured to manage this risk? You know, the, the fact that we've got silos, um, functional specializations, different metrics, different measures, different penalties. Should we be looking different as an organization to win in this world? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start with a quote from one of my colleagues, Clive Novus. I'll give him a shout out. He, he always has this quote um, that says, the attackers don't care how we organize ourselves. <laughs> right and i and and it always stuck with me and that's absolutely true in fact it works in their favor right so so we structure ourselves according to business units and silos and who's in charge do the outside attackers care no they don't um like i say it works in their favor often in most organizations so so do we fix it with structure um we could but I mean, uh, to me, it actually comes back to the to the culture discussion. We, um, if security teams that struggle, it's often they, they they butt heads with the IT team because there's a person in charge, the the CTO or the CIO wants to do stuff their way, and security is seen as an inhibitor, and you know they 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 don't allow people to do what the what's often called the business prevention unit, right? The BPU. Um, so, so security can be seen as a BPU or it can be seen as an enabler. So, so again, it talks about that, that it's, it almost comes back to the culture to say, first of all, is does everybody know that security is everyone's responsibility, right? And that must start, that must permeate through the organization. Um, it touches on that DevSecOps um, topic of yours, Herman, to say, if, is, is security everyone's responsibility? That's sort of the principle, the guiding principle, right? And when once people understand that it's everyone's responsibility, it's, I shouldn't be butting heads with the CTO to deploy our you know security software to the organization. We are we should be partners, right? They should be just as worried. They must be just as worried about our security posture. The CIO, the CTO, and everyone else must be just as worried about our security not just the security team so it comes back to to that sort of intangibles right you you um you know to to, to answer your question and um I don't, maybe i should just stop there to give everyone else a, a chance does that answer your question but yeah, um very good because the, the risk is, a, is, is 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 another aspect that we can talk about especially availability risk mm, fantastic I'm, I'm, look I'm, we, we we've got a lot of questions here i want to just pick up on some comments uh, that that have been loaded into the in, into the chat box. Deepak's comment is, it's not really a question, but it's a good segue into the next question, which is from a business perspective, I think we're chasing the money and chasing the data for this purpose. Securing data and privacy is always an afterthought and or a thought that's uncomfortable to deal with. This requires a fundamental mindset shift at board level and at the human firewall. And um, Sean, Sean makes a comment, uh, Sean Robinhammer says, these bad actor organizations are well-funded, sometimes as much as 100% more budget than our customers. On top of that, they're more collaborative in some instances. Are we as companies doing enough to work together to share information, to be more proactive? And do we have enough budget? Um, Herman, what are your thoughts? I mean, you know, I mean, you, you, you're almost fighting against nation states here. How, how do we answer this question from, from Sean and this comment from Deepak? Well, okay, so on the budget thing, I think most companies that I know of or CISOs that I interact with don't have a budget issue. I think that was that was an issue in the past where they used to fight for budget. I don't, I don't, I think personally, I believe since 2016, when these major attacks started, we, we potentially have an opposite problem. <laughs> we are uh, like, uh, I mean, I've been in budget sessions where I wanted to take stuff out and our execs were like, Yes, you can see the reluctance. They're like, we can take it out, but please don't ever come back and say something happened because we took that thing out. So, so we almost have the opposite problem, but it comes back to a, an execution issue, right? I don't think it is a budget issue. I don't think, um, I think if all CISOs across the world have the access to the same technology, right? So it's not a technology issue. It becomes an execution issue. 
Um, how quickly can you how quickly can you adapt? Can you rip and replace? We have a stated rip and replace strategy. You should be able to, if you want to keep pace with the with the attackers, you must be able to rip something out, replace it, like within a month, within two months. There are lots of organizations that can't replace something in three years, in five years, right? You can't you can't replace a single endpoint agent. It can't take you five years. And you hope to keep up with with the threats right so so which i want to open comes back to the culture issue right and 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 how can you execute quickly in terms of the comment of um, of the board yes security have been traditionally was always seen as a as a cost center it was seen as a necessary evil um it's almost like insurance what we want to do as an industry, what we should do is say, how do we turn security into a business differentiator? How do we get to a space where we take our security scores or security ratings, like a Moody's agency does a, you know, a financial rating on a company, and how do we start publishing that? Show it to your board, show it to your execs, start publishing that. Um, and then our, that, that can turn into a business differentiator in terms of if a client, a potential client, looks at all the banks maybe the services are you know quite the same vanilla um they would probably go for the one that has the highest security rating because people are very worried about their privacy these days they're worried about their, their data security so they they would want to go to a place i would imagine that's that's more secure you know um so so we can start changing that narrative and i can promise you that once we start publishing those scores, the number one thing the board is going to want to know about every single time you talk to them is what is our score? How do we compare to others? Right? What's the other scores and where are we? And that can, so that can be scary, but I believe it can also help make the industry much better. So if, if, if all those scores are published, now we start gamification, you know, sort of gamifying it where everybody knows that the scores are published and then we can actually make the whole industry more secure. Um, so, I mean, that's the, that's the intended, that's the benefit. The risk, the, the issue of course, is that we must all agree that how we score it, that we all agree that it's, it's, it's real. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a scoring mechanism that we can, that we can game the system, you know, to, to sort of fake it, to make our scores look better. And that's the actual challenge. It's not, I mean, the idea I think everybody will, will buy into quite easily, though, the issue will be, do we all agree that the way that we are scoring ourselves or using a system that scores us, we can all buy into that because we believe it gives you a true reflection of our security posture internally and externally. Mm, nice. I like that. That's, that's great. I mean, we, we, we do it already with carbon credits and carbon rating and how green, how green is your company and... Um, you know, how, how environmentally friendly is your chicken farm or your farm and, you know, that kind of stuff, right? How organic is your food? We're doing it now. Why can't we do it with security as, as well? That's a nightmare, for, I guess, for boards to even think about, but what a great way of thinking about it. Um, Ibrahim's got a really interesting question here, which is how can one change the mindset of our leaders towards better governance and security? I like that question. I'm going to wrap it into, I guess, a, a, another piece, if I can. Jason, I'm going to, I'm going to come, come to you now. Because that's, that's a good question, right? There is, there is this mindset challenge around governance and security, which I think translates into a disconnect between dev, sec, and ops. And why do you think there is this mindset and this disconnect between different parts of the business? Because again, I'm, you know, in my opening comments, uh, first question to Herman, I said, it's kind of a no-brainer we've got to work together on this, but we don't. Why do you think that is? There's something built into the process, right? That's stopping us. Yes, there is, but I believe they haven't experienced uh, an outage uh, bad enough. Um, funny enough, I was presenting to uh, a board pretty recently and uh, the chairman of the board jumped up and said, well, we're not a bank, right? <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, you know, we're in, we're in sales, right? We're, we're trying to convince people to do things and they go, well, we're not a bank. We don't have their budget. Um, we also don't have their customer data. So it's not that important to us. And we're like, that's interesting. I said, so what keeps your entity running? What is important to you? Um, you know, how you see the risk in your business is so important. Could you afford to be down for seven, well, in Department of you know, Justice's case, you know, 
12, 15, 18, 20 days. Could, could you afford that? Could you afford not to service your citizens? Could you afford uh, not to engage with your data owners, your service providers, you know, whatever it is, you know, if you understand your risk, you know that you can be down for a month, then, then you're good. Then you understand your risk, right? Then everybody in the business knows, okay, we're okay. We're down for a month. We can still, whether it's a manual court system or whatever, we can sort of still keep running. But if you don't understand that, right? The foundations of understanding governance and the foundations of understanding risk are a bigger problem in your organization. Um, in many organizations we walk into, and, and again, it's not so much in, in financial organizations, we walk in and we go, okay, what is your BCM plan, your business continuity plan? And most importantly, we talk about preparing for zero day, right? We talk about ransomware and, oh, you've got to prepare. But most importantly, are you prepared? And what is your strategy should that happen in your organization? The, the challenge that we have is, again, you know, I'll come back to answering the question now, is that most of these attacks are automated. You know, we're not, we're South Africa, bless us. You know, we're not nation state stuff. Um, trust me, you know, when we look at some of the major attacks that have happened in our region, it's because, and, and Herman was coming back to it, when you look at the, the physical address of our organization, so that digital footprint that we have, right? So everybody likes to tell everybody what we're doing. Excuse my French, it's as fraught as you can imagine. You know, we're not, we're not maintaining basic things. And that, by the way, comes back down to governance. So, you know, in, in, in I think in some of the larger organizations, we're very fortunate. We have this tier one and tier two strategy in businesses. So we have the oversight guys that are looking, you know, after Hermann and Co and making sure, and that's generally the governance guys. But in many organizations, you don't have that capability. And I think it is so important that those two entities are part and parcel. And the same as privacy, right? And I know we haven't touched much on that now, but governance, privacy, and, and information security, if those three players aren't playing together, um, your organization is on and hiding to nothing because without those three entities, and, and by the way, very difficult to bring privacy along because it's legal, right? You know, you give, uh, <laughs> we, 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 we generally call them the sales prevention strategy, right? But the point is, is that the minute that you bring in those three entities, if you cannot create an agile methodology there um, as a business um, and your processes, uh, you know, end up hindering you, uh, again, I, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before, as we've spoken about, the guys out there don't play by our rules. And mm. because they don't play by our rules, they can effectively compromise us and exploit us far quicker than we expect. So, again, for me, it's, yeah. you know, how do we, and, and don't get me wrong, as an organization, and I know the people in the room, we're talking to multiple, you know, entities inside of a business in order to try and get everybody on the journey. And, you know, thought leaders like Herman and, you know, and, and Demetrius, you know, it's so important that we put those people in front of other stakeholders and other organizations because some folks, unfortunately, were still doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Yeah, you know, I love your comment about don't play by our rules. And I want to re refer back to the point that, that Herman made around attackers don't care about our internal structure. Just a quick story. I mean, when I was the chief security officer at Standard Bank, the attacks were always on a Friday afternoon before a long weekend. And they knew that the security team was going to be away, right? So they would hit us right on that Friday. So, and and you, you're right. They're not playing by our, our, our rules. So I love that comment. Just to continue on that point, Jason, Marcus Bender's got a really interesting comment and then a question linked to the point you've just made. I see a trend in which, so this is Marcus's words, I see a trend in which the cybersecurity organization is very good at writing policies and circulars in which, for example, the CIO and the IT organization is made accountable for ensuring cybersecurity standards and regulations are being upheld. And with that, they've satisfied their governance responsibility. But actually, nothing has been achieved. Because IT organizations are no longer equipped from a resource and expertise perspective due to years and years of cost reduction initiatives. Your thoughts on that, Jason, and then I want to go Demetrius and Herman on that same question. Thank you. I, I have one response is, and, and it's, it's, I, I recently spent some time doing some executive coaching. Um, IT is a business issue. It is not an IT responsibility. And what we're finding is when policies are created, business owners are expected to create those policies. IT, cybersecurity, information security, they're expected to execute against those policies. So if, if there's fundamentally a challenge with the policies that are created by the business, um, it's very quick to, you know, we're very quick to blame IT and we're very quick to blame cyber. From, from my perspective, you know, 
those policies need to be as agile as the organization's transformation strategy. And if they're not, um, it's the policies and the processes. And again, it, all of those policies are gonna affect, gonna affect culture. Um, I see in, in organizations organize, you know, where, where people are practicing policies, uh, which in many cases don't make sense, right? But it's what we do because we've got a policy in place. And, and the reality is, again, coming back to what we're seeing our threat actors doing is, you know, we understand at this point in time that social engineering is the number one vector that is being used to compromise organizations, right? So that's you and me and all the personal things that affect our lives and how much access we have in the organization. So when you start understanding that, the culture of the human component is, is so, so important to understand what to look out for, how to do it. So, you know, unfortunately, when, when governance and policies come together, you know, again, it's, we're executing against those policies. Creating accountability, however, is about putting the right oversight in place and making sure that that's happening. So, yeah. you know, and, and Herman will know this, one of the biggest challenges we've had, and, and I think where Splunk is really, really great, is how do you pull in all of these technologies, processes, people, issues we face as you know, information security you know, people and, and then provide a report that says, hey, I'm going to save you a billion dollars this year. <laughs> it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that, right? Herman spends probably 40% of his time pulling together reports, making sure the board understands the issues, um, a report that the board firstly understands, right? And, and I think that's where we, you know, the translation and the oversight is so important when creating uh, accountability in any business. I like that comment. So it's really around the fact that we've got to balance compliance against policies on the one hand with augmentation of capability on the other hand. So, so Marcus, great, great, great question. And I want to hear uh, the, the thoughts from T Dimitris and Herbert on this, but Dimitris first, your, your thoughts on this, great point. Sure. So <clears throat> you have a lot of standards out there Right. You have the classical ones, which could be, for example, PCI compliance. You have uh, GD, GDPR compliance as well. And all these kind of, depending on the organization you have, you have to adhere to specific standards. Right. And, and if you pivot into an organization as well, each organization has their own policies afterwards that they implement internally that we need to, to look after. In a lot of situations, I think a lot of these standards and policies is also a baseline. And it's up to an organization to be able to see if they're going to go an extra step to be able to secure. It's not only compliance. It's not only that checkbox that if an auditor comes, we have everything in place, either internal audit or external audit. It's actually looking and seeing what new threats are coming up and seeing how you are going to protect the organization, right? So it's not only about stopping at and saying, I got a policy in place. You know, I need to have these controls in place. It's about how you're executing against that, how you're progressing, how you're involving, how you're identifying new threats, how the people internally are also being able to, to accomplish this, right? Because, and the second point of the question that's being asked by Marcus is around, you know, because of these costs, for example, reduction initiatives, people are, are, don't have the expertise and maybe you don't have people, right? Which goes down to the point that if you have a policy in place, you're either going to accept the risk, you're either going to transfer the risk, or you're either going to, for example, um, do something else to be able to you know, compensate for that. So it comes down to in a lot of situations where people will start you know, buying technology because they believe that this will be able to take care of a lot of the problems of expertise. Right. They will go and purchase MSSPs to be able to help them, for example, with this you know, lack of, of initiatives and knowledge within their internal teams, too. So to answer the last question, one of the most important things that large organizations need to do is, first of all, break the silo so they can work together. Right. Use policies as a baseline, but also knowledge sharing across these firms will also help a lot. Right. So if someone is identifying a risk that needs to be, for example, mitigated across all verticals within the finance or it's a new trend, for example, that they see, for example, in South Africa, then it's not only the responsibility of that specific group. If you have access to that knowledge and a way to be able to combat that threat, it becomes you know, a more automated task each time. And going back to Herman's point uh, before as well around you know, having you know, those security standards and those security scoring, I'll give you an example of what Dubai did last year. They created what they called the cybersecurity uh, index. For all the government entities, they have to publish out their scores, right? How secure they are as well. So it becomes a problem 
of everyone afterwards, right? To be able to strive towards that. And you keep on pushing things, right? So you're able to, you know, get more budget. You're able to push for more knowledge, for more expertise as well down the line, because you know that, you know, you're in the forefront. You know that people are looking at what you're doing. And if you're not secure enough, you will go to the next thing. Maybe people don't understand the details of the security, but when they look at the score, maybe they, they don't want to bank with you. Maybe they don't want to work with you, right? So it all comes down to, you know, visibility, breaking down the silos, you know, and then everything will start getting pushed and people will invest more because it's not only going to be a cost center, it's going to be something that we need to, you know, work for. It's, it's, our, it's our livelihood at the end of the day. Yeah, nice, nice question. I, I love that. I love that uh, cybersecurity index, actually. It talks to the point that Herman made earlier. Brilliant. I'm going to go check that out after, after this call. Super <laughs> idea. Herman, your, your thoughts around this, because I, I love the point that Jason made and that, and that Marcus made, which is a lot of what we're doing is what I would call security theater. Right, it's, we're going through the movements, but we haven't augmented anything. It's compliance versus uh, uh, augmentation, which I think is the way that Jason expressed it. Herman, your thoughts? Yeah, great, um, great question, and thanks. And I've had some time to think about it. Luckily, with the two previous panelists, you know, um, <laughs> the order off the cuff. I will, I will start with another quote, if you, if you don't mind. Um, it was from a guy called Samuel Shah. His company is called NetSquare. He spoke at ITWeb many years ago. And one of the quotes that stuck with me was the question of, are we defending against attackers or against the auditor? <laughs> right? So let that sink in a little bit, because I believe a lot of organizations are busy defending against auditor and against regulator and are not against, reg against actual attackers. So that leads to Marcus's question of, you know, that sounds to me like um, we are, we are fixated, we are, typically fixated on frameworks. Um, lots of organizations do do that. They say, here's a framework, we're gonna tick all the boxes, you know, we've, we've done our policies, we've done our mandates, and we've done our bit, right? But, I mean, does that move the dial? Are you actually effective? Are you actually secure, right? So we believe, and again, dare I say it's a culture issue, uh, we are, and we sometimes joke about it, but it's true, we are more of a principle-based organization than a standards-based organization. So make no mistake, standards are great and frameworks are great as a baseline. I think Demetrius has touched on that. As a baseline, do I have gaps? But we believe, and we talk to the board about this and they buy into this, that if we are secure, Compliance and regulatory frameworks, all those things will we will be naturally be naturally be compliant to those things. But first and foremost, you need to be secure, right? And the other things will come after that, not the other way around. So the question then that begs the question: How do we know we're secure? How do we know our security is effective? We um, I mean there's two things. We, we someone uh, Jason touched on hygiene, which we can talk about. Um, but first of all, what we should measure, and I mean, he spoke about the Splunk dashboards that he's seen. First of all, we've got to say, are all our controls everywhere? We want, we, we have a stated objective, we want 98% plus coverage of all our security controls across all our servers and all our workstations. So we need to measure that, right? We measure that with Splunk dashboards. We build an asset DB every day. We check against everything that we know about and we aim for like 98%, right? So you, that's coverage. Then the next thing is how effective are your controls? How do we test effectiveness? We test it with red teaming. We test it with pen testing. We do these targeted attack simulations from the outside that's unscoped where we get the most sophisticated attackers that we, that, that we can get to try and compromise us um, unscoped. Not again, if you talk about the silo issue, not scoped to this business unit and that country and that, that's playing games. We say, here's the entire organization, you can come in anywhere you want, and we, we can then take that back to the board and say, this is how secure we are. We, we were able to withstand sophisticated attackers for three months, for example, right? That by their own admission, gives them way more comfort than our risk ratings and are we doing this and we're compliant to NIST. You know, just that, and again, it, it's not it's not the tangible, it's not the, oh, but we, we, we're compliant to NIST. It is, we were able to withstand these sophisticated attackers for X amount of time. Of course, there's always issues, 
We are taking these issues, we are addressing them. We, at the next board, you know, we have like quarterly meetings typically. At the, in the next quarter, we'll, we'll tell you how much progress we've made towards addressing that. That gives them a lot of comfort. So it's, yes, you, you made a great point, Herman. It's the, sometimes it's theater, sometimes it's making, you know, ticking boxes and, and, and a sort of almost absolving accountability to say, but I've done everything I could. You know, because I did all these things and, you know, I can't get fired because we're complying to PCI, you know, or to NIST or to whatever. But, I mean, that's, it's often playing games. Yeah. No, I love that. That's, that's a really super point. Thank you. Um, look, I, I think that we, we, we are, we've got a lot of great questions here, right? Bramley Meitzer at, 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 uh, at Sassel saying, do you feel large? Well, he says so, someone argued you can't be digital when you have analog processes. Do you feel large organizations driving cybersecurity programs modernize their processes? I feel like agile organizations must balance efficiency and flexibility. What do you think, Herman, on that point? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, everything's got to change. It's uh, and that's why I think security is becoming a you know security leaders are becoming business leaders. And that it comes back to the business differenti differentiating um, topic that we discussed, right? Is, um, I mean, do you have a seat at the table? I guess is the, the, the always the question, right? And if you don't, maybe like CISOs, they're always on about, oh, but I should report to the CEO, or I should report to the chief risk officer. And, you know, it's sort of a, it's a game lots of people play. Our view is you should report to where you are the most effective. It actually doesn't matter who you report to. Do the person that you report to give you the right budget, give you the right buy-in, give you the right support? I mean, that do, does everybody buy into it? Um, security will be the differentiator. I mean, uh, Jason touched on privacy. You know, I read a quote the other day that said, um, you know, we said the data was oil, but privacy is gold. So maybe the biggest differentiator in future will be how, how well do you protect my data, you know, coming back to that scoring system. But if I, if I know, like, why, why did, why did a lot of um, very wealthy individuals bank in Switzerland in the past because of that privacy aspect, right? So they, they, they knew that their privacy was protected. And, um, and as banks and other organizations, I think that is something that we should pursue much harder to say, we promise you that we will not, you know, our organization will not sell your data, will not give it away, will protect it as much as we can. Um, and that can also draw, you know, more clients and, and, and help with retaining clients. Okay, excellent. Look, I think um, I for integrated services loaded a question that I think you've basically answered, which is, you know, companies hire wannabe hackers to secure their organizations while depending on systems. How do we recommend a, a solution to this organization? They also think that shouldn't organizations think of re-engineering specific programs they're utilizing before they, they implement. But I think you've, you, you've addressed that, but thank you for that. Keep those questions going, folks. We've got another eight, seven minutes left. I've got a question that Dion posted, which is really a, a outside in view. And I want to just add something to it. He, his comment is, does legislation in South Africa support the prevention of cyber crimes? Um, he says, the problem is that, that the South African police force needs world-class cyber skills to investigate cyber crimes. Now, in my experience, that's actually quite rare. And also, companies don't cooperate between each other. So let's start, Jason, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you and then Dimitri and then go back to Herman. What are your thoughts about this outside in view? You know, is it, can you solve the problem in the, in the ecosystem outside the company? You know, if you, are you passing the right laws, building the right capabilities in enforcement organizations? Should we be working with Interpol and should we as banks and telcos and other organizations with vendors be cooperating together to deal with what's an existential threat? So Jason, first. And, uh, and again, thank you, Herman. I am. Um... I've got a view on on a couple of things, and and one of one of the things for me is, you know, when we look at the threats to national security, the largest companies we have, um, there's a certain level of logic that comes to my mind. Right? Is we have, you know, what eight or nine egress points into a country, and you know, uh, we have telcos providing services um, across the country. You know, we're we're Wi-Fiing ourselves up, kind, you know, governments. Uh, organizations, everybody's Wi-Fiing, everybody's making this, this transformation journey really easy. 
when I think about cybersecurity, you know, the first thing I think about, and this was back in my day working for a different provider, was would it not be easier to protect those egress points? You know, because again, we all talk about we all talk about you know, there's no there's no there's no borders in the cyber realm, right? And you know, when we start to look at countries and and organizations and entities that are proving to be successful now, collaboration is important. Looking at what's coming in from the outside uh, is so important, which starts at a legislative government perspective, right? So, you know, when we start seeing, and, and again, obviously we've seen quite a couple of things happening at a national government level, you know, the first thing is to do is let's switch off our networks and let's figure it out, right? And, and I appreciate that. But instead of saying, hold on, where's the problem coming from? Um, and, and the outside in approach for me, you know, where we work with people like Herman at the moment is it's the best way to do it because inside we can sort of, we can manage and we can do, but if I don't, you know, start looking at the outside in, and, you know, when you actually look at the problem that we're facing as countries, as global, as, you know, if every organization being countrywide focused on how is this stuff getting in, how are the bad guys taking advantage of my community, my digital citizens, you know, let's start figuring out how do we do that or how do we start with legislation at the top? And, and don't get me wrong, South Africa might be a, a different conversation to have and that might be a longer journey. But organize, I mean, countries that are doing it right are starting to pass laws. Uh, they're starting to make it, you know, uh, illegal to do certain things. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying let's go the other route, right, where we don't allow anybody to watch the internet after nine o'clock at night, right? But the point is, is when we look at the bad actors and, and how organizations are losing money and how we are being affected as citizens and digital citizens, I mean, there's just, for me, there's fundamentally got to be a different way we look at this. And for some reason, um, to get the right people in the room, uh, to have that conversation, that, that's the only way we're going to influence yeah. change, or we're going to stay where we are. Um, and people like Herman and some of the financial institutions that are really protecting their crown jewels, the outside in approach on the inside uh, is the best possible way. Because again, like Herman's highlighted is, you know, when you're looking at an organization, I've got to look at it like as I'm a hacker, because that's the only way to protect yourself. And also then I've got to prioritize. So I think there's a bigger discussion here, but I, I'd love to yeah. see change happening in that mm -hmm. aspect because every country, and we're seeing it, right? Those countries that are proving to be agile, uh, the UK, Germany, uh, some of the, uh, the Eastern Europe uh, areas, these guys are really taking it seriously. And, you know, I think it, until a country gets to the point where they realize that it's yeah. costing them, a, let's call the number trillion dollars a year, then they influence change. Yeah. So again, uh, you know, at what point do you need to get to before you actually influence that change? Jason, what you're describing is exactly the way in which the world attacked COVID, right? It was fragmented and we're seeing the consequences of that. And it's almost the same thing playing out in security. So folks, we, we've got three minutes left. So dimitri has got a minute, Herman, you've got a minute and I'm going to take a minute to sum up. Dimitris, you, you first, go. Uh, you're on mute, Dimitris, sorry. Yeah, so I, I think we talked about some very interesting stuff today. Um, I think we all know that security, I think it was mentioned in the, in, in the comment as well, it's in our hands, right? It's not only an organizational issue, it's about every single person making sure that they are doing the right things. It's about being able to be agile, to be able to you know learn and, and go with the times, to be able to evolve as well. Um, I think it's about collaboration. I think that's one thing that people need to start understanding a bit more. We need to share more, right? It's not something dangerous, not something, you know, taboo, right? Sharing is caring at the end of the day. So the more information that's out there, the more the people are able to defend against uh, the new security threats that are emerging and find those patterns. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank, thank you, Dimitri, and thanks for joining us on the panel. And Herman, your, your final... Okay, so I've got one minute. Basically, the short vision is, yes, absolutely, we must collaborate more. It's, uh, there's no business uh, advantage to not to, to one being more secure than the others, and we do. As a, as, a, as a banking industry, we do collaborate a lot, first of all. Secondly, I don't believe in more regulation. Um, I, I believe in the, the Jericho principle, if I can call it that, where if everybody is more secure, then, um, then we will all be collectively better. I worry back to the, to, to the risk, to the framework fixation. If it's regulation, people will fixate on being compliant to the regulation and frameworks and best practices by their very nature is the bare minimum that you need to comply to. It's not the maximum, it is here's the bare minimum 
and that's what people will go for is to just be in to just be secure enough and i think so so i'm not a i'm not a big fan it does play a part but um i would i would want us to be i would want the regulators to just come in and say show me how you are being secure without having regulation that may drive the wrong behavior Fantastic. Uh, Herman, Demetrius, Jason, thank you so much for joining us. What a great set of sound bites. What a fantastic panel. Culture is about beliefs and actions. Who's accountable? Uh, attackers don't care about your structure. They don't play by our rules. Don't set up business prevention units. Data is oil. Privacy is gold. Uh, try to get this balance between compliance and augmentation and the inside out versus outside in. And be careful about you know th think about who we are defending ourselves against is it attackers or is it auditors and regulators what a wonderful set of sound bites fantastic folks thank you so much to all of you thanks to the panel and thanks to the um, attendees as well and join us again at a future session thanks all have a great day thank you